Well, I have this uh, mobile history museum from the south side of Chicago. Uh, it tells the story of the African-American aviators from the south side of Chicago that were pioneering aviators in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And they really changed the course of history. And I felt compelled as an aviator and somebody who really likes history and the history of aviation to tell this story. And it really starts with Cornelius Coffey and John Robinson. They were two auto mechanics, highly skilled auto mechanics, that found the aircraft engine similar to the auto engine at the time, and they thought, well, we should be able to translate our skills as auto technicians into aviation. It was a new field, it was a golden age of aviation, the 20s and the 30s, and they really wanted to be part of it. So they started investigating, and they found out it wasn't that easy for African Americans to get into aviation. And they knew the history, they knew that a, a fellow Chicago, and her name was Bessie Coleman. Uh, she had to go to France to learn how to fly because she couldn't get anyone to teach her aviation in, in the United States. So, but they didn't have that kind of finance. So eventually, they figured out a way to get in. And one of the ways that they started was by building an airplane. They found a company in Chicago named the Heat Aircraft Company and th they made a plane called the Heath Parasol that you could buy as a kit. It, it used a motorcycle engine from a Henderson motorcycle and that interested Mr. Coffey because he had driven a Henderson as a young man delivering special delivery. And Robinson and Coffey decided they were going to build this airplane. They found an empty storefront on 37th and Indiana in Bronzeville in Chicago and they started building their plane. In about six months they had completed it. Now they had the, the obstacle, another obstacle, where are they going to fly the plane out of? And they tried to get into airports around Chicago and they had difficulties. They found an airplane for sale near where they worked. They worked out in Elmwood Park at a Chevrolet dealer run by Mr. Ermel Mack. And near this Chevrolet dealership there was an airport called Acres Airport and there was a plane for sale there. So they went there, they talked to the pilots at the airport and the people that were selling the plane and they told me, if we buy this airplane, can we fly it out of this airport? And they came to the agreement that they would be able to do that. So that's what happened and that's how they got at the, at the airport, Acres Airport near Elmwood Park. But as they were learning how to fly, the pilots noticed that they were highly skilled mechanics, they had already built an airplane, they were teaching themselves how to fly, and they, they needed their help. They were building their own air, airplane, it was called the Acres Ace, and they needed mechanical help, so that's what happened. They started working with the pilots at the airport, they became good friends, and eventually the pilots told them, why are you commuting from Chicago to Elmwood Park every day and only being able to fly a few, you know, a few hours? If you came and lived here at the airport, because this airport was basically an old farmhouse, if you came and lived at the airport, you could get more flying time in. So that's what they did. They moved out to Acres Airport and they lived there with the white pilots and they started flying and that's how they got their initial experience. But they wanted to go to an actual accredited school to get the aircraft technician's license. It was called A&E certificate, airframe and engines. Now it's called A&P, airframe and power plant. But in the 20s and 30s it was called A&E. They signed up for a very prestigious school on the south side of Chicago. It was just open. It was called the Curtis Wright Aeronautical University. And they sent their money in and when they went showed up in the fall they told them hey listen we can't accept you we have students coming up from the south it's going to be an issue we want to give you your money back well they didn't want their money back they wanted to go to school and they told them no we want to go to school here we're not going to take our money back so they went to the place where they worked in Elmwood Park and they told Ermel Mack who ran the, the dealership they told him what happened and Mr. Mack was a very enlightened person 
he actually, when he hired Mr. Coffey, he called the school where Mr. Coffey graduated from and he told them, who's the number one student in your class? And the owner of the school told him, well, I don't know if you'd like to hire him. He's an African-American lad and, uh, you know, he's our top student. So Mr. Mack, he said he didn't care. If he was their top student, he wanted to interview him. So he, the owner of the school told Coffey, Mr. Mack wants to hire you. You know, this dealership's in Elmwood Park. You probably, if you work there, you won't see another African-American person for a month. And uh, Mr. Coffey said, well, I, I don't mind because uh, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and I was the only uh, African-American in the class, so that doesn't bother me. So Coffey went to talk to Mr. Mack, and he hired him. And that's how he started with Mr. Mack at that Chevrolet dealer. So you could see he was a very enlightened person. And when he heard that they weren't accepting them, he threatened to sue the school. So the school, under the threat of the lawsuit, they started investigating the two young men, Robinson and Coffey, and they found out all about them, that they had built their own plane, that they were already flying at Acres Airport. They just wanted to come to school to get an a, you know, official education and a license, a certification. So they let them in. And in the beginning it was rough, but the, the teachers in the school set the students straight, it all went well, they graduated at the top of their class. And doing that, they were so impressed with them, they told them, listen, if you stay on as assistant teachers, we'll let you, you know, form a class. And if you go into your community and the neighborhood that you live in, which was Bronzeville on the south side of Chicago, and gather 20 or 30 African-American students, we'll start a class. And that's what they did. And that's how a very large group formed of African-American students at this aviation school. Now, when they canvassed the neighborhood, they noticed that a lot of women were interested in the program. And they really didn't find that unusual because they were inspired by a woman pilot, Bessie Coleman, who had had to go, gone to France to learn how to fly. So <coughs> when the ladies started showing up, they had no, no issues with, you know, allowing them to participate in their, in their class. And luckily they did so because they wound up being some of the most influential pilots in African American history. People like Willa Brown, Janet Harmon Bragg, Lola Jones, they really helped change the course of history. So this is how it started. And they were all going to school and they did well with the mechanic training, but uh, of course they wanted to learn how to fly as well. So they formed a club called the Challenger Air Pilots Club. And after school, they would talk about planes and Coffey and Robinson would give them ground instructions on how to fly a plane. But they wanted to fly an actual airplane. But unfortunately, the airport that Coffey and Robinson were flying out of, Acres, got subdivided. So they no longer had an airport to fly out of. And now it would be even more difficult because it wasn't just Coffey and Robinson, it was their whole class of 30 students that wanted to learn how to fly. And they knew it would be next to impossible finding an airport that would allow them to do that, being African American. So they went to a town called Robbins. Robbins is an African American community that was just south of Chicago, a small town, and all the officials in that town were African American. The mayor was African American, the police chief was African American. So they thought, if we go there, they might give us a piece of land and we can start our own airport. And that's what happened, and they, the city did give them a piece of land. Of course, it, was, it had trees and boulders and all that, but they managed to bury the boulders, chop down trees, they built a hangar, and they started an airport. And this is a photo commemorating that, 1933, Robbins, Illinois. This is the first African-American-owned airport in the United States. And that's where they learned how to fly. Now they needed a, Coffee and Robinson had a plane, but it was inadequate for teaching people how to fly in. But one of the women aviators, Janet Harmon Bragg, that's her in the corner, she uh, had saved enough money to buy an airplane. She had $600 saved, 
And so she bought them their first airplane with the understanding that the group would maintain it and fuel it and that they could all use it to learn how to fly. Now that's interesting that she would have the $600 saved to uh, buy a plane because you have to think of the time period that this is happening in. This is 1929 to 33 and it's the depth of the depression. So people didn't have jobs, there were soup lines, the country was in, in, in real difficulties. But this group was very determined and they were able to do it all through the depression, which you know, kind of gives you an idea how motivated and how, how, what a group of people they really were. They were able to go to work, uh, go to school at the same time, uh, build airports, buy airplanes, learn how to fly, all through the depression. So that was what was going on with this group and they call themselves, like I had mentioned before, the Challenger Air Pilots. And they were trying to figure out how they could use their new skills in the field of aviation. But being the Depression, being African American, it was difficult to enter. So they imagined that maybe they could do something in the education field and get more people into aviation so that they could start their own companies, their own schools, and that's the, the route that they took. And Robinson was a graduate of the Tuskegee Institute in 1924. He had uh, been a graduate of Tuskegee as an auto engineer, and it was now his 10th year reunion. So he figured that we could they could fly a plane from Chicago to Tuskegee, Alabama and convince the Tuskegee Institute in 34 to get aviation. They got there, they were very uh, cordial to them and happy to have them come, but they were really not interested in aviation. They thought it was too advanced, that there would be no employment for the students once they graduated, so they turned them away. They wound up going back to Chicago, disappointed, but not completely discouraged. You know, they, they've had, they had other obstacles put in front of them, and they always managed to overcome. And this one was just another one, and they just had to figure out what to do. They heard that the king of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, wanted to start an air force. What? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is some yeah. Story. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they, they contact the Ethiopian embassy in New York. The king finds out about it. He says, send a representative over. If he does well, then the rest of the group will, can come over. So that's what he did. So like in late 34, 1934, he went to Ethiopia. He proved to the king that he could fly and maintain the plane. The rest of the group was going to go over. Italy invades Ethiopia. And that's why the king really wanted to start an air force, because he knew the Italians might invade, Is right? That before the second invasion? Yeah. Wow. So they were, the, you know, Mussolini. And the war was a precursor to World War II. They, the Italians had mechanized troops on the ground and airplanes that were in close support, sort of what the, became the blitzkrieg that the Germans used in, 19, in, you know, in World War II. But it started in Ethiopia with Mussolini and the Italian army, and John Robinson from 37th in Indiana was there, right? <laughs> so he's flying like wounded people from the, from the uh, you know, front lines back to the capital. So he's doing air ambulance. He can't fight against them because he would have been. So he's evading them and, you know, doing air ambulance and liaison. He manages to survive. But of course, we know the history. Italy at one point, you know, uh, took over Ethiopia. And the King Haile Selassie wound up in England. And John Robinson got stuck in Paris, France. A good place to get stuck, but he couldn't get home. Exactly. So, yeah. So, uh, Coffee sold his airplane and they paid for his trip home. So he had an ocean voyage from France to New York and then they bought him a TWA airplane ticket from New York to Chicago and he landed at Midway Airport 
<laughs> which, which back then was called municipal. And they had, a, and here you can see him, he's in a uniform now, because the king had made him a colonel in the Ethiopian Air Force. So he, they have a parade for him down Archer Avenue, right? And then they get to the south side of Chicago in Washington Park, and 20,000 people greet him. And so he's a celebrity now on the south side of Chicago. And everybody knows about their group now. And one of the people that got interested in him was Annie Malone. And she was a multi-millionaire African-American lady that started a beauty products company called Poirot Beauty College. And, the, and she would make these beauty products for African-American ladies and have the, the uh, women sell door to door. Sort of like Avon, right? And she became a real, you know, rich lady and she got interested in him and she had four mansions on, on South Park, which is now King Drive. And behind one of these mansions, they, she had a coach house and she gave it to them to start their school. And that's how they started their school. She bought an airplane for herself for them to fly her around. And then they had another airplane. With, and what they did with that was they barnstormed the South to get kids to come up to Chicago to learn aviation. And that's what they were doing in the 30s. Now, Robinson was really interested in going back to Ethiopia, you know, because he was a colonel. The king maintained contact with him. And as we almost, you know, towards the end of the 30s, we were, we knew we were going to go to war, right? But, so the group was thinking about how could they participate as pilots in World War II. Robinson was thinking, when, uh, when's Ethiopia going to be liberated so I can go back, right? But, and so there was kind of like a split in the idea. Now, because the kind of split in the idea what to do, Willa Brown starts coming to the forefront. Now, she had a master in 1933, she had a master's degree from Northwestern University in business administration. She was a, a pilot, a, a mechanic, and now she helped Coffee, Mr. Coffee, with the help of Enoch P. Waters from the Chicago Defender. You know that paper? It's a historic black paper. It's still in existence today. The Chicago Defender. It was run by Robert Abbott at the time. He was the founder. And he's, the, he's actually the person that helped Bessie Coleman uh, go, to, go to France. He helped finance her license, right? Now it's 1939 and they want to form this organization so they employ the help of the Chicago Defender. Willa contacts Enoch P. Waters and they form an organization called the National Airmen's Association of America. And this organization was to promote aviation, to understand how many African American pilots were in the nation, and then to lobby our government not to exclude them from programs that they knew were going to come into existence because we didn't have enough pilots for World War II. The government was going to create a thing called the Civilian Pilot Training Program where they would train people to be pilots so that if we went to war we would have enough pilots. So they knew their school qualified. They created a school called the Coffee School of Aeronautics. They knew it would qualify but because it was African American they would be excluded. So they had to do something. So with the help of the Chicago Defender, the paper, they contacted all the officials in Washington, congressmen, senators, you know, and told them that they were going to fly a plane from Chicago to D.C. as a goodwill flight, right? And this commemorates the flight from Chicago to D.C. This is Chauncey Spencer. He's the son of Ann Spencer, a fa famous black poet from Lynchburg, Virginia, who was part of the Harlem Renaissance. But she never lived in Harlem. She wrote poems about her, her garden in Virginia. And, but everybody from the Harlem Renaissance that would travel south, they stayed with her and, you know, she had, uh, took care of them. And yeah, so that was her son who wanted to be a pilot and he went to Chicago to learn under Mr. Coffee. So <clears throat> he and Dale White flew a plane to D.C. and they met the politicians and they also met Harry S. Truman. 
who became our president, but at that time he was a senator. Then he became vice president and the president later. And he's from Missouri, the show me state. So they want, right? So he said, show me this plane, yeah. right? So he goes to the airport, he sees the plane, and, it, and he goes, wow, if you flew this thing from Chicago to DC and had the guts to do it, I have the guts to see you get what you want. And that's what happened. So they managed to get in the language of that program that, and Willa was responsible for the, writing this language, that African Americans would not be excluded from the program. So their school in Chicago and six historic African American colleges got it, like Tuskegee now got, wants it, uh, Howard, Hampton, all the big ones, right? They want it. But they had never taught anybody to fly. But their school had. So what the government did, they assigned uh, an officer to oversee their program. Now they thought when they gave African Americans this opportunity to train pilots, that they would just train them to fly and get the basic pilot license. But they didn't understand who these guys were, right? And you know, Willa was part of this, was, ran the school in coffee. They got, they, this Noel Parrish was a, a lieutenant overseeing it. He gave them all the programs. Right? So they got not only primary, which was just basic flying, they got secondary, which was advanced, was aerobatics, cross country, navigation, meteorology, aircraft familiarization, and instructor rating. Right? And, and to, get, to do all of that, they need a high powered airplane. Now their school had these Piper Cubs, which is a plane like that, a basic trainer, but they needed a really expensive airplane to do all that aerobatic stuff. But because their school qualified so well, they got loans for these real high-powered aerobatic planes. UP, yeah. So they were able to acquire the, the equipment and they got all the programs. Now what really freaked our government out was that because they had been around Chicago for so many years and all the pilots around Chicago knew them, they had a really good reputation. And as you can see in this picture, what do you notice weird about this picture for 1940? Um, it's white people and black people in that picture. You got it, right? <laughs> so now here's a school run by an African-American lady and an African-American man, right? Willa Brown and Cornelius Coffey, that white people are going to, to learn how to be pilots, not just to fly around, you know, but military style pilots, right? So the government's like, whoa, this is like too much. And what they did was they started building up the program in Tuskegee, Alabama, which segregated Alabama. Tuskegee was a segregated university. And they actually, in Chicago, they already had the military base and the lieutenant and old parish that would have accepted these integrated units, right? And they would have started an integrated Army Air Corps unit. But what they did is they had to build an army base next to the college in Tuskegee, you know, to keep it segre segregated. And, and that, that's what, what happened. But they continued through the war to run their integrated program, plus they helped all the other programs. Although they protested, you know, officially the, uh, the college uh, in Tuskegee being, you know, having it a segregated unit, they protested that but they knew that's what the, was going to happen and they didn't want it to fail. So all the, a lot of the early instructors came out of their school, you know, like Lewis Jackson who was the number two at Tuskegee. So a, a lot of the early instructors at Tuskegee came from the school in Chicago. And, that's, and, the, and then, although they had a good training program, it was being run by wh white military officers and they were conforming to the segregated South, and it was failing. So, the son of the poet, right? Yeah, right? This is Chauncey, your son. He now is in charge of integrating one of the largest air braces in the United States, because President Roosevelt, in 1940, signed an executive order making it illegal to discriminate in employment in a federal employment, right? So they had to integrate this base, right? So they, they, 
they integrated, he was integrating the base, and when the program was uh, not running well at Tuskegee, they sent the son of the poet to investigate, right? And what happened was he was able to inform our government what the issue was. And what the, our government did was wind up sending Noel Parrish from Chicago down to Tuskegee to run that program. And then it worked out fine, you know? And then those pilots from, you know, uh, the program in Tuskegee wound up being fighter pilots in World War II and having a really extraordinary record. And after the war, Harry S. Truman became the president and he, in 48, desegregated the military with an executive order. So, yeah. so these, this group of pilots from Chicago made it all happen. They were a big South influence side. from the south side of Chicago, right? Hey. And, uh, and a really instrumental was Willa Brown, a lady from the south side of Chicago that really helped change the course of history. So, isn't it a beautiful story? Right? Yeah. Uh, well, I was kind of stunned by the presentation because I'd never heard a word about the contribution of African Americans uh, to the development of aviation in the United States. And uh, this whole development uh, in the Chicago area is amazing and really deserves to be learned about. And uh, yeah, I'm really stunned by hearing about so many contributions which I've never ever heard of. I've never heard a word about this before. Well, I think especially taking the initiative and um, exploring uh, areas where they could put in airfields and finding airplanes and finding uh, people who would teach them and uh, setting up uh, flight schools. Uh, I mean, it's like starting at ground zero and building everything up, whereas some of the rest of us just, you know, walk in the door of the school and get everything on a silver platter. These guys went out and uh, invented their future. I think this program should probably get a government grant and go across the whole country and, uh, yeah, be in high school parking lots, grade school parking lots, even at the shopping mall. Well, I mean, great connection between Chicago and uh, Los Angeles and the history of uh, aviation out at uh, Clover Field in Santa Monica. I mean, maybe there should be an exhibit like this at uh, Clover Field and keep Clover Field open. This is actually in the air, ancient stuff, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is, I might not, I've never been in the front seat of, a, of an airplane ever. This is black history, especially at Lamert Park. What better place to be in the airplane than Lamert Park? You know what I'm saying? We need this, man. We need this a lot, so I appreciate my aviation men right here for bringing this plane out, making this possible. I appreciate them for bringing black history out, enlightening the real black history or the good things of black history. You know, our first aviation people, our first doctors, our first inventors. That's what we need to highlight. People want to highlight the bad stuff and make fun of it, and it's not funny. It's fantastic. I'd love to see that there was uh, sisters and brothers working together back in the day and made something the aeronautics work like this. So I was really impressed. It's going to be happy to have them here next week, tomorrow. That's what I was going to say. Oh. So what you think? I love it. <laughs> oh man. That was great. Well, I've been there. It's made for you. And I really enjoyed it. It's a story about So what you think? It's, it's a little, I don't know how I would figure it out. I want some pilot lessons now. <laughs> this one flies? Yes. This one flies? Yes. <laughs> yes. Same. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, yes. No, they made it and flew it. Well, hopefully they'll make a movie about that. <laughs> and that's, I love that's it. one of the reasons I'm trying to
just like Churchill with that. Chicago and LA, I find that the same, I get the same reaction and people appreciate it just as much here. Even though it's not a story about uh, Chicago, you know, you would think that the Chica people from Chicago would, you know, be more receptive. But I found the people in LA to be just as receptive as the people in Chicago. I think they appreciate the story. It's really an American story. It's not just about Chicago. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's been really great.